You're watching Finish or Fail, the show where I, Digibro, and my fiancé, Pantsu Party, talk about whatever anime we just watched, whether we finished it or failed it in the middle. This one's about Mob Psycho 100 Season 2, which we got done Mob watching last Psycho night. Mob Psycho 200. Whoa, I'm watching in Esper Vision right now. Everything looks like... Fuck, because these are actually kaleidoscope goggles. Be closer goggles. to the screen so they can see how... I am a kaleido is. man. I look like an alien. You're like a butterfly. I am alien boy, alien boy. <laughs> so, Mob Psycho Season 2. I thought that at least at first... I would even say overall, I might think it was better than Season 1. Production-wise, I'd say that this was a step up. It was... And the first season's production was incredible. Oh, yeah. So that's not like, that's not a light statement. And this is a great franchise to put more of a budget into because there's so many creative things you can do with the powers and the gimmicks they got going on. So yeah. it was really exciting and, really, yeah, it was just really exciting to see that I think what I appreciate More the most attention was going into the is animation. The, the fact that the the animators went so like weird at times. Like there's parts where it's just good old fashioned action choreography where shit just looks badass. Characters are just like, you know, fist fighting, teleporting around, doing the usual shonen shit. But at other times, the art just goes uh, totally just weird and bizarre. Like it doesn't represent anything Completely realistic. Abstract. Abstract, that's the word I'm looking for. Because, yeah, the powers themselves are abstract. It's psychic abilities that don't really have a clearly defined uh, set of parameters. This is not like a, a shonen where everyone's powers are like, uh, you know, like Nen from Hunter Hunter where there's a bunch of rules governing it. It's kind of just whatever. It's like, yeah, I uh, my emotions explode out of me and they cause things to happen. And so when I think about what art is at its best it is you know an abstract representation of emotion it's something that can't necessarily be put into words something that is better expressed through you know maybe something like visuals of course if you're in an animated medium and so they use the visuals to represent mobs emotions and that is what the powers are they are emotions you know um so instead of just it simultaneously looks like an enormous amount of power because the things that are happening are huge in scale and very sudden, uh, but they're also like, they also are different enough that you get the sense of like, oh, that's Mob's anger exploding, not just his psychic ability. Yeah, they do a really good job at, at framing what is going on in the story to what the power looks like. So you're able to tell like why this is happening what yeah. led to this happening and it, it's without needing great. words to explain it yeah it's, you can look at it and it get really it. takes the medium as far as possible and it's 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 really entertaining when it all happens so fast and i think that's one of the specialties of one as a manga artist is that he doesn't like to fuck around i mean one punch man the the gimmick is that he kills guys in one punch but like in general his stories tend to have a lot of very sudden twists and turns. Enemies are destroyed very quickly or like emotional turns are taken. Like it'll seem like one guy's on top and then suddenly he's on bottom and then suddenly he's on top and it turns out this guy was betraying you but then he was betraying him and like it all happens very rapid fire. And there are times, particularly in like the last five episodes of season two for instance, where it happens so fast that it has no weight where, like, the, there's just constant twists happening, and I don't really care because I'm not, not emotionally invested. invested. in right. either side at this point. No, because the characters are Randys, and, like, they're not the characters people... characters are all Randys except for Mob. Well, and Reagan and Dimple, but, you know... Yeah, just besides the main characters. The main guys. Like, season two, I think, let's start off on the weakness, doesn't really introduce any any new characters that move the plot forward. Like, the, the one-off yeah. characters are great. I would say the best new character is probably Mogami, the enemy psychic, and even he feels mm -hmm. he could have been used more because you have this uh, two-parter, episodes four and five, that's all about Mob being trapped by this guy in this alternate dimension, this guy who basically feels that because society is capable of so much evil... 
that they're not worth protecting. And in fact, they're worth dominating or destroying. And so uh, he tries to convince Mob the same by making him experience a life like the one that he did. And that guy, he has like one moment in the finale where he comes back as like this crazy ethereal monster that turns into a giant tree thing. And it, it is fucking awesome, but it was so short that I didn't even realize it was him until like it was already over. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, that must have been Mocha. Oh, I guess that was all he was doing there. You know, and it's mm-hmm. like, ah, I wanted more of that guy. He was way more interesting than all these other fuck boys. Definitely. Because you have the claw people who return, who already in season one, I thought, I had the same problem. Like, And they sucked worse in season two. Because they don't do anything in season two. They don't two. do anything they're, they're of work. They're just there to be extra fodder for fighting. Yeah, I mean, they're basically all the same character in season two. They're all after the same thing. And now, granted, that's used pretty well in the battle with the teleporting guy because everybody's fighting him. And so it, it makes for a really fucking cool battle that all these different powers get to play off of each other. Grant, I'm not saying the last five episodes sucked, because there are moments that are incredible, but, like, just those characters in season one already, to me, felt underdeveloped and one-note. Each of them just kind of shows up, they have a quick little battle, and again, while what I like about one storytelling is the fact that things happen so fast, when that's all the character's involvement in the story is, is showing up, establishing their power, and getting their ass kicked, and then being gone... Not a really interesting character. I would argue that they're even more one note in the second season because yeah. it's not about their individual personality. It's about what their their goal as an organization is just to like yeah. to get revenge or whatever. To 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 I they just they just turn coded. They're like we're on the other yeah, side. Yeah, they're now, on the other side, know. but like it's not that they're them as individuals matter. No, neither none of them has individual goals. It they would just have been better if they have... just selected a couple of them, but they brought back literally all of them. Yeah, it, I mean, it would have made more sense, because, like, why would all of them have... Like, I thought it was interesting earlier in the season when they brought back the Beastmaster guy and made him sort of doing his own thing. That, like, he's around... Um, as his own character who's involved tangentially. Yeah, with his own interests and his own priorities. Right. So to have everybody else have just grouped up and be like, hey, we're all on we're, your team we're now. We're all a group. We all think the same. We're all in for the yeah. same... We all want the same thing. And, ending. I mean, they brought back all the fucking... the baby psychics from season one who were even less interesting, who... I mean, they were basically a joke in the first season. So to have them around again, it's like, well, I didn't care about them. And, like... I appreciate giving everyone an ending, sort of, but having them around more than for, like, five seconds, you know, more than just as, like, a quick joke is... I understand how this can contribute to the themes of the series, that, like, everyone matters, but, like, they don't in the context of the show. It's not a good sell to have a bunch of characters around for one second. I just think it would have been more tasteful to have selected a couple. Mm-hmm. A couple characters who made sense to be there at that instance, yeah. who were more interesting to watch, or who had actual personal reasons to be there. Right. More more than just, yeah, we're all fighting against yeah. Claw. I mean, and, and the another part of the problem is that, like, by that point in the show, I didn't care about Claw or, like, the, their return, because, like, in the first season... That whole plot basically gets established, like, five episodes from the end, right? And it's it all happens and is wrapped up. You have some foreshadowing that it's going to come back in season two, but it doesn't until the last five episodes. So, like, if Claw had been maybe shown operating in the background, if we had established more about the big boss or his son up before that point then I might have had some emo- emotional investment. But it really, to me, felt like we were putting the story on hold to do this claw Yeah, thing. me too. Because the story that I'm invested in is that of of Mob improving himself, of him, you know, training to get better, uh, working up the courage to stand up to people, even standing up to Reagan, uh, kind of admitting that he knows that Reagan's not a real psychic, which is kind of like... I mean, I feel like episode 9 was almost the completion of Mob's arc. We got to a point where he is like, I'm going to try to finish top 10 in this race, and then I'm going to go confess to Subomi. And how I would have expected that to end would have been that, like, even though he didn't finish the race, 
he gets to talk to her anyways, and maybe there's some further development in their relationship, because, like, we're already at a point where I don't really know how much farther Mob can or needs to go. He's already become a self-actualized individual. He's making his own decisions, he's confident, he's inspiring the people around him, and so, like, I'm ready for that arc to resolve, but instead, the last five episodes were a bunch of fighting. And, like, it's not that there wasn't thematic messages interwoven in there. There absolutely was. Uh, Nate, in his uh, Best Guy Ever Weagawa video, made a bunch of great points about the sowing the seeds that happens throughout the season, most obviously represented in the fact that he literally receives seeds which protect <laughs> him from the final attack in the end. But, like... That doesn't change the fact that a lot of those last five episodes is a bunch of monotonous, monotonous plot twists between characters I don't care about. Like, the, the whole plant guy. I will not even remember that that guy existed by the time season three comes around, you know? Did he die? I don't even remember. I don't remember either. Don't remember. What the hell was the point? Like, teleport guy left an impact because he had such a long fight scene. I don't remember any of the other five members of the Ultimates. Um... You know, main bad guy, he basically was only interesting insofar as his ideals conflicted with mobs. Um, I wouldn't say that he is, like, a great standalone character. No, and they really tried to force it. They really tried to force us to care about him. I mean, I, I think his backstory is interesting. It's just that we don't learn enough of it. Like, I wish we'd spent more time with him, you know? I think he could have been a great character, um, the fact that he had a wife and all that and, and like the whole falling out he had with her being established kind of after the fact uh, didn't have as much impact as if we had known no. what, he, like if we had known that this man had once been great before we saw this final battle, you know, it might've had a little bit more emotional stakes in that final conflict to know that he wasn't just an, an evil man forever who's just been evil for 20 years, to have known that there was something being lost in all this, you know, some reason to care about his kid's conflict with him. Because, like, we don't know enough about his relationship with his kid. Like, were, was there a time in their life where they were really happy together? Was there a time when, you know, like, what has this kid lost? Why is he so angry? Why couldn't he have done something about it earlier? You know, it's just like, some of those questions are a little bit answered after the fact, and at that point it doesn't have as much impact when we've already seen the final battle, you know? Definitely. Um, do you have any more points about, like, your negative points about the show? Negative points? Nah. I loved, I loved season two. Yeah, I mean, overall, I did... It's just that those last five episodes took it from a nine to an eight for me. Yeah. And that was sad because that was how... I had scored the first season, because the first season was like, the first time I watched it in the early episodes, I had less of a sense of where it was trying to go. Like, I thought of it as more of a gag comedy at first, probably because I was coming off the heels of One Punch Man, and it took a while for it to sink in that it was supposed to be more of a serious character study, you know? Um, so... My first time watching it, I was a little bit more confused, and then I was definitely let down by the final stretch of battles. My second time watching it, I understood what it was going for. The early episodes appealed to me a lot more, but I still felt like those last battles... I mean, aside from the final episode, which is great, because of Regan's whole, you know, talking down all the bad guys, telling them basically like you're acting like children and all that stuff... Like, yeah, that part is great, but the three episodes leading up to it are just a bunch of fights, you know? Um, so with season two, the fact that it started off seeming almost antithetical to that, there was way less action. What action there was, was more pointed and all of it was really beautiful, you know? Um, Definitely. it was so much more about the character study and just getting really into the bones of Mob, showing him developing episode after episode, you know, it always felt like he was growing. So then in those last episodes, when it felt like his his personal growth wasn't as important as just, you know, this general theme being tied into just a lot of fighting, which, granted, still looked badass. And what am I, am I popping off the camera? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, bit. and again, I don't want to discredit how incredible the episode 11 fight was. I don't know it, who all animated it. It looked like a lot of Yutaka Nakamura animation, who, of course, is... 
mine and now everybody's favorite animator. I liked him before it was cool, uh, way back when Sword of the Stranger came out. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I mean, it's I'm not going to try to claim personal ownership over the greatest animator of all time. But, uh, yeah, um, it was fucking awesome. It was really fucking cool. The animation is always amazing in Mob. It's... I don't know how Bones does it. I don't know... I don't know how they're capable of this in a TV anime. Like, why isn't anyone else capable of this? Why are they the only ones? Is it just talent? Do they just have yeah. the best animators? Or? I don't know. I think with, in particular, the character designs in Mob, they just understand what animates the best. Yeah. And they, they care about how to appeal to fans, how to market their shows, how to appeal to the West. They do a really good job at it, and they fucking brought on serious yeah. talent for the show. There's definitely an element of the fact that a, a lot of people like to talk about the fact that when Japanese companies make anime, they're not necessarily thinking about the West. Ooh, the Western audience. Like, That's not true with Bones. Well, and, and yeah, well, because Bones has always had success with yeah. in the West. But, like, I think it's partly that most shows should not think about success in the West because they won't have it. But if you know your show's going to be successful worldwide, that's a much bigger audience. You know, it's just a lot more money. And, like, if you're making something like My Hero Academia and it has a lot of success worldwide, then it's like, yeah, well, now you can have that expectation that that's going to happen. And, like, One Punch Man being a huge success worldwide, I think they just went, you know what, Mob Psycho has a lot of the same appeal, a lot of the same animators and staff working on it. We're going to market it the same way. And, I mean, it, it's on Toonami. So, like, yeah, I, I definitely think that the fact that they know this show will be a worldwide success contributes to their is ability to pour it. It is. Nate said so in his video. That's excellent. Yeah. That's, that's a great show to bring to the West, because it really shows you, like, what Japan has to fucking offer. And I love that it's something that doesn't just look like a standard anime, no, but it... No, definitely. Like, because so many people have this misconception that anime looks a certain way, and it's like, there's tons of stuff that looks like this, but it doesn't usually have the opportunity to have animation like this. You know, if you watch... Um, something like Ping Pong, which does occasionally have incredible animation, because of the way it looks most of the time, uh, it would probably not be able to be played on Toonami. No, it's going to alienate a lot of people. If yeah. Like, this is fucking ugly. And I'm, I'm really happy that Mob Psycho had that risk taken of a show that, like, yeah, it's very unconventional looking, it's not necessarily that aesthetically pleasing, but they were confident that they would be able to succeed on the merits of how fucking good the storytelling is, how fucking good the animation is, and that people would get the joke. They would get that it looks that way on purpose, that it's supposed to be, you know, ugly, but also absolutely heart-stoppingly gorgeous at the same time, you know? Um, so I'm very fucking proud of Bones for making this show. You know, as a longtime fan of the studio, it's, uh, it's gratifying to Definitely. see them create things that I legitimately love to look at, um, which I don't, like, it's it's funny, because I can be jaded, and, like, when I give Mob Psycho, like, an 8 out of 10, I feel like there's people who will be like, but, come on, and I'm like, but, dude, no, an 8 out of 10 is a rare score for me, it's like, I feel great about that, like, if I get to watch an 8 out of 10, it's like, oh, thank God, thank God. I got an 8 out of 10 this year and like it was almost a 9 it's like a high 8 to a light 9 um you know maybe I could be convinced to raise that score if I rewatch the early episodes because we did have kind of a gap between us yeah, watching the, the early, early stuff episodes the... I felt a lot more strongly about than the later episodes yeah I mean I I don't want to dive too much into the first episode just because Nate already talked about it in depth in his video you yeah. should definitely watch that in addition to this one because yeah, he out. makes a lot of good points um but the second, uh, arc, or the first, well, the first arc after that episode, the one about the dragger, um, aesthetically super interesting when they fight in the swamp, the dragger has a really cool, like, move set and way that it animates. It reminded me of Dark Souls a lot, especially because it's a two-part fight, and I really felt like it would have been a good Dark Souls boss, um... Or Bloodborne boss, just because there's that element of, like, almost Lovecraftian horror, that this is a creature that's, like, created from your understanding of it, you know, like, and the only reason to not, the only reason Mob's able to beat it 
is because he's so out of the loop of society that he's not developed a fear of it. Hikikomori powers. I relate to that shit. That was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed that arc. I loved uh, the part... I guess that was just episode two, right? And then episode three is the one about... Um, the, the ghost family that Mob doesn't want to kill. That was also great. Because that's him coming into his own as an individual by realizing he's facing a situation that is totally unique to him. That, like, nobody else would have to face this moral dilemma. And to regular people, um, you know, they have so little understanding of ghosts that it's, it's like, of course they're evil. They're scary. They make me uncomfortable. And, like, um, as best guy ever sort of just mentioned it's a good analog for racism i mean that's how people feel about other races is that they dehumanize another person uh, another people to the point where they're just like oh it makes me uncomfortable so, so get rid of it you know um, we treat animals that way a lot for instance and like surely if we could empathize with animals we'd probably be less likely to do it and some people do empathize with them i don't but you know that's just me i mean animals ain't people no, they ain't people. They ain't people. They ain't got the, the cognitive capacity. Whatever you can say. You don't say. have the cognitive capacity to lead. That's a Tenacious D quote. Um, then we go into uh, my favorite arc, which is episodes four and five. The one where they fight the psychic who's possessing the little uh, purple-haired girl. Yeah, that was um, the best. I loved the whole atmosphere of the initial scene of them... Um, being in, the, like, the huge group of psychics all, like, having to deal with the girl, you know? And, like, this show just does such a good job of tone setting in every scene, especially in this season. Um, again, the dragger part in the, in the swamp had a very unique feel to it. Uh, even them, like, working on the field in episode one had a unique feel. But, like, the part where all the psychics are trying to, like, exercise this girl, it had this... Even though it was funny a lot of the time, it felt very, like, horror movie-esque. That, like, you know, the things she's doing are creepy and this large number of people is disturbed by it. And there's this, like, push and pull between them. And, um, and then, uh, you know, the, the fighting starts and it's pretty awesome. Uh, anytime Dimple takes over Mob's body is, like, my favorite. Because the way that he just suddenly becomes a fucking badass and he looks awesome. It, it's just hilarious because Dimple looks like a disgusting booger cloud. And Mob looks like a dipshit. But when you combine them, they suddenly become the coolest guy in the world. Um, I think that's really funny. Um, and then the, the whole arc that they're inside of the... The whole part where Mob's in, in the universe of Mogami's creation. And he uses this, like... This this power that l the way it's represented on screen looks like nothing. Like, it looks like pure emotion, pure... What was the word you used earlier? Abstract? Yeah. Pure abstract Fraction. representation of just emotion and power. And it's just like this swirling, massive... I want to talk about, a little bit about how... If you want to communicate power... The two things that communicate power the best are scale and speed. Those are the two things that, that I think humans relate to the best. Because, like, if you want to if you want to go out and kill prey, you know, like, what you need is the strength to wield a spear and the speed to be faster than the thing you're trying to catch. So, like, those are two things humans innately understand. It's, like, strength and speed. And so, in this show, whenever something badass happens... The camera will pan out suddenly. You'll see a huge explosion happen just like that. Bow! You know? Like, uh, I think of the part where Mob's fighting the final boss and, like, he, he turns, like, he, like, traps him in a giant icicle. Do you remember that? I do. He, like, pins him against the wall and the camera just goes, like, bam! And it all happens at once. This huge ice thing. Or, like, the, a character will get punched and they'll fly through seven buildings in, like, one second, you know? And it's that, that scale and speed, that viscerality that makes everything feel like, holy shit, these are like the strongest fucking characters. Like, these are so much stronger than regular people because it's so much faster and so much more intense than anything that could happen in reality, you know? Um, and that's what makes the animation so fucking well done. Um, 
And then we get to the Reagan arc. Did you have anything you wanted to say about those first parts that I just railed through? The and first parts? Yeah. Up early until episodes. what episode? Uh, up until the Reagan arc. Because we watched all that yeah. uh, a few, like a month ago before we had to move. I mean, I know your video addresses a lot of the points that I want to make. Yeah, about the Mogami arc. About the Mogami arc. Yeah, I have a video coming out on the 8th on the main channel. Um... That will talk about the the specifics of that, which is apparently a controversial episode. Like, there are a lot of people who said they didn't really care about episode 5, or people who only really liked the Reagan arc and stuff like that. I thought all of the first seven episodes of season 2 were, like, incredible. Um, I thought the first episode was incredible for the reasons Nate described. I thought the Dragger episode was incredible, both for its unique tone and just, like cool animation, cool ideas, the fact that they went to a new location and it felt very different. Episode 3 had a really interesting moral dilemma with Mob, uh, you know, again, facing something that only he could really understand and having to make a decision based on his morality without really having anyone for guidance because who could even grasp what he's going through, which puts more distance between him and Reagan, which makes yeah. it more understandable when Definitely. episode 6 happens, you they, know. They sow the seeds early. Exactly. Yeah. All, always sowing seeds this season. Uh, and then episodes five and six, I'll talk about um, the thematic messages of that in my upcoming video. But yeah, then six and seven is the ep the arc of Reagan's personal... Was it six and seven? Am I getting these mixed up? Was oh, the Dragger arc right. two episodes? Because I feel like it was the first eight episodes I thought were really great. Um, I don't really remember. I think the Dragger arc might have been two episodes. That makes That's sense to me. Possible. Um, unless I'm just missing a whole episode. I also love that the internet starts getting integrated into the show in season two. That Reagan builds a hilarious, flashy website that looks like a fucking old MySpace page. Yeah. With all the flashing icons and shit. Um, well, then we get into his arc where he finally says something wrong enough and manipulative enough to Mob that Mob is like, fuck you. Um, um, and the... My favorite part in that episode is when he's at the family restaurant with the friends and like it does a really great job with the music and animation and everything of like enveloping you in this atmosphere of like yeah mob's having a good time this is a really fun time he's having with his friends and then he gets the call from Reagan and it's like the music cuts out and he looks really disappointed and he kind of gets up and he's like I've got to do work, guys. And, like, you feel this, like, really huge tone shift. And then when he leaves the restaurant, like, the sad music finally kicks in. And it was, like, they just did such a good job of making you feel the disappointment that he was feeling. That you're, like, man, that really sucks that Reagan did that to him, you know? And so, like, you feel like Reagan's an asshole for this one. Um, and that he's totally not understanding. And so when Mob's, like, fuck you, you're, like, yeah. Yeah, fuck you, Reagan. And then we find out that Reagan has no friends, and he falls into a depression downward spiral. Oh, the fucking battery died. We were about to talk about, I think, the Reagan arc. We were talking about how he made a website, and that was cool. And it was like a MySpace. And then uh, Mob tells him off. And then he turns out to be a lonely man. And he's going he through his, his first sip of alcohol. That's what you and were saying. Bombs like a bit. But it wasn't actually alcohol. The bartender says I didn't even put any alcohol in it. So he vomed on the psychosomatic effects of thinking he was drinking alcohol. Um, even more of a bitch in that case. But yeah. A double bitch. That was pretty funny. Um, and then his big uh, his big running with the internet was. Uh, hashtag relatable as someone who's been in plenty of in internet controversies myself I know what it's like um, he of course handles it very poorly cause that's how I mean he handles it how a normal person would how like how it would be totally reasonable to handle it but you're living in an absurd world um, but they presented it pretty realistically and uh, you know in the end Mob comes to his rescue he realizes that he valued Mob a lot more than he could have thought that Mob had been offering him just as much as he'd been offering Mob all these years. I hadn't realized they'd been working together for three whole years. Yeah, it's crazy. All of middle school. So yeah, that was a that was a great two part episode. Great exploration of Reagan, um, sort of getting us into the mindset of like sort of what he would be doing. 
Because I did kind of wonder when we were rewatching season one, like, he's basically a massage artist, like, first and foremost. So I was like, does he actually make more money doing this business than he would as a massage art, like, guy? You know, like, is this actually a practical application of his skill set, which is clearly massive? Um, and we kind of learned that that was never really what he cared about. Like, he's not just in it for the money. He was in it to do something unique and to, like, meet lots of different people and learn new things about the world. And he was just about bored of it. But because of Mob, because of him getting to sort of mentor this kid, uh, it brought new things out of the job. It, it brought new life to it that made him appreciate doing the job again. That was interesting. Definitely deepened his character and made it more believable that yeah. he would be doing this job. Uh, and then after that, we get the episode that's about Mob just um, trying to run the marathon. Which is, it made me think of Mob as a very Moe character. Like, I feel like this season presents Mob as somebody who, everybody just wants to see him succeed at this point. Like, everybody who's around him just admires his, you know, his, like, determination. They admire the fact that he won't give up that he's so steadfast in his beliefs and um they all want to see him win um and you know that's it's it's a magical feeling when you compare it to how it was you know episode one season one where he's somebody who has no real support other than reagan kind of who's using him and like now he's going to the point where he has all these friends he is, you know, being looked up to even by his own mentor. Everybody wants him to succeed. They see him as this, this no longer just a dumbass kid who they can manipulate, but somebody who they themselves look up to. That's another great moment in the, in the last five episodes is when the, uh, the muscly guy defends him. And like puts it like is like on his hands and knees like trying to protect mom. Oh yeah, from a curb stomp. Yeah, that was fucking great. And then Dimple possesses him, and oh. he fucking wrecks. One hundred percent muscle usage. Ah, yeah. that was one of the best scenes as well. Another reason that I can't I can't discredit those last five episodes. Tons of great shit happens. Tons of great thematic shit. Tons of great action. Just you know. Not as dense with things I care about as the previous episodes, which were pure character study bliss. And, like, when Mob comes home from the race, his family's burning up. What did you think when you saw that scene? I couldn't believe that they would have this in a show. What, did you think it was real, though? Did you think they I were really dead? I don't know. I, I kept thinking, like, well, this is Mob Psycho. It might just be that they are burning up but it also might just be that it's a total psych out i mean it's a great show to do it in because mob psycho is pretty unpredictable and like i think that's something gr another great thing about one's style is that he is willing to pull crazy tone shifts he's willing to pull crazy twists but usually i don't trust shit like this like, the fact that the corpses they showed didn't resemble his parents closely enough to be for sure um, and the fact that Mob is generally a more lighthearted show. Like, when we got to that scene, my first thought was, I won't believe this until there's confirmation. And, and that's a general rule I have for all media. If someone dies, I generally don't believe that they're actually dead. Until unless it's proven. Either it's proven or the show is over and they haven't yeah. come back. You know, like, I, I'm just not the type to count on them to be dead because it's... Because you've seen enough. I've just yeah, I've seen too many people get revived. I've seen too many people not really, you know, like I've seen too many plot twists that were just for the purpose of stirring up drama. And so like when we watched that episode, I immediately was like, okay, if this really did happen, that's pretty fucking intense, but I'll believe it when it's confirmed. And like right away at the start of the next episode, they tried to make it like it didn't, it, they weren't dead. You know, like, Dimple immediately is like, well, there's other things that could have been the possibility. I'm like, well, okay, they are. They obviously. show them later in the episode. Right. It, it doesn't take long for them to confirm that they're not dead. So I wasn't surprised by that. Um, you know, if it had been... I, I, of course, didn't watch this weekly. I don't know how people reacted to it, seeing it in the moment. But I would have been hard-pressed to believe it was real, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, it was a, it was a good dramatic scene. 
it was like, oh shit, you know, like, wow, you, because the whole episode was so sunshine and rainbows up to that point, it was so just like happy-go-lucky and like Mob doing his best and everybody looking up to him, and even though there was, there was a scene where um, his brother becomes tricked into thinking that Tsubomi has another guy she's interested in, but it's right away resolved. Like, we as an audience immediately learn that that's not really the case. And I thought there might be some dramatic consequences for that. Like, maybe uh, Ritsu would tell Mob, like, oh, she's into somebody else. And he would mistakenly give up on her. Or maybe he would resolve anyway. I, I don't know. I don't know how it was supposed to play out. But, like, um, none of that happens. No. It's just kind of swept under the rug. And uh, instead we go right into this action subplot. And... Ultimately, I was disappointed that we didn't get a, resolu a resolution to the Subomi thing. And, like, apparently, from what I've heard on Twitter talking about it, there's not that much left of the manga that hasn't been adapted. It could be a third season. Some people said there's enough for a third season. Some people said there's enough for maybe a movie. Um, whatever the case... It seems like the things I want resolved do get resolved in the manga. It's just that they didn't get resolved in this season. Um, so if they continue it, maybe we'll get exactly what I want. But as just watching season two, it was like, I would much rather have continued that development than have Mob go into a fucking coma for two episodes. Yeah, that was a lot. Uh, that's all my thoughts. Do you have anything else you want to say about Mob Psycho 2? Uh kind of beat us over the head with some of the themes about trying to be a nice person and doing nice mm -hmm. things for people and like I do appreciate that you know an anime has themes yeah it'll help it'll help kids but like it didn't really do that much for well, me we're not personally. kids yeah yeah I couldn't appreciate it on that level but uh, I liked I liked it I thought the animation was fucking stellar I mean it, it like it comes down to I think there's a lot of people who will celebrate a show just for having themes at all because there's so many shows that don't. But it's like, you can have way deeper themes than this. Like, the yeah. themes are well explored. They are exemplified well in Mob. They're inspirational. And if you are a younger audience member watching this, it might teach you something. But, like, yeah, I mean, as an adult... I got nothing out of that and because right. it was so forward and so kind of it's kind of like it's very much characters stating the theme yeah exactly like, that's why i found it like i couldn't do a full video on this show like um when i do a analysis videos that are longer it's usually because there is something that is subtextual about the show or something that i don't expect all audiences to understand and even when i talked about mob psycho season one I felt like season one was more subtextual. It wasn't so on the nose because Mob himself wasn't... Um, he didn't have the clarity of mind to be able to explain how he feels or explain his morals. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to season two, characters are literally having conversations about morals. It's yeah. like, there's nothing I could say about this that would add to it. And I feel like Nate already covered probably the biggest subtextual thing about the, sh the, the season, which is the planting seeds thing. So, like... I'm not just going to rip off what he said. It's like, I don't think there's a ton of subtext in this show. It's mostly very direct because it wants you to get it. It wants you to take these messages with you. And, I mean, that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing so about too. the show. There are some shows that need to be direct and need to just tell people how it is. And if they can do a good job of that, great. But, like, yeah, I mean... As, a, as an older viewer, it's like, I already know these things. And even as a female viewer. Yeah, what it what added to it as a female It's viewer. just that, like, there were, the first episode specifically was about him kind of courting this girl who was dating him um, because mm. she was dared to, basically. Mm. And what Mob gets out of it, it's just like, yeah, like, sure, that's a good value to instill in youth males but like i didn't get anything out of it mm. i didn't particularly think it wasn't like have you ever been in a refreshing. situation like that girl no no good person would be <laughs> you never known anybody who's, who's been in a position like that like dared to date a guy maybe elementary school students yeah you think that was like pushing it for yeah i do mm. i do all right 
interesting take. It's kind of like nobody would be in that situation in real life if they if they had any balls. I, I would definitely say that it. Uh, I, it's not hard for me to believe that somebody would date a guy on a dare. It is hard for me to believe that the other girls were like such cunts that oh, they would yeah, like tear up her novel and everything. It was a little cheesy. It was cheesy. really cheesy. Uh, I mean, I, again, I thought it made a, it, it made for a good thematic point, but yeah, yeah definitely. it was unrealistic I mean, in a way that mom usually is. If you're is. watching it for the themes, but I don't think most people watch anime to, for the themes. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that Mob Psycho is intentionally a cheesy show. Like, yeah. it's, it's, always, it's meant to be kind of a comedy. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, you know, um, it has... It always kind of, uh, Nate pointed this out too, like with the giant broccoli at the end. Like even though it's making a thematic point, it's doing it in a funny way that kind of lets the message go down as less preachy. But like in in moments like that, it's just kind of, it still feels pe preachy. Oh, definitely. Like it, it still feels to me as uh, as yeah, an adult like, viewer. Don't like, be a MGTOW. Like, yeah. okay, I don't need this fucking shield. And, like, most audience members aren't going to need this yeah. in well, the show. But, like, most I, adult audience members. But, well, I won't even say most. I think you underestimate how retarded most people are. But, like... Oh, I always do. You always but do. But I didn't get anything out of it. So, it just Yeah, I appreciate kind of like, that. I'm, like, I can appreciate why you can, can read that message out of it, but yeah. I was kind of bored by that. Like, I, I, I definitely like the first get that. episode because I thought it was a creative way to handle a relationship, but like, yeah. I didn't necessarily come to the same conclusions. I mean, I, I feel that way a lot of the time when with, with anime that people defend on the basis of the themes that like, oh, but it's saying this. And I'm like, yeah, well, I already know that. You know, like, I don't... Just yeah. Hearing someone repeat something I already know is not automatically engaging to me. Um, but, you know, I, I just think it, it does a good job of being entertaining and communicating themes that I do want people to understand. So if somebody doesn't get it, I hope they will. But yeah, for me individually, I'm not like learning le life yeah, lessons from Mob Psycho. I, just, like, I, I already know these life lessons. It didn't personally appeal to me. And when I think back at it, it's kind of like, well, fuck it. Like, why am I watching this? Well, it's more entertaining in the moment than it is to look definitely, back on. Definitely, definitely. Um, it's not the kind of show that you continually think about and, like, get all this new stuff out of, like, you know, it's not Evangelion. No, it's not. But it's, it's, it's also... A, it's a great show. Yeah. I like Mob. I'm a, and I that's, like that's why I always fall on the side of 8 out of 10 with Mob, because it's like, I think everything it's doing is good. I think everything it's doing is correct, but it's not like... The kinds of shows I like to like, uh, I like to watch the most, or the the kinds that I would give a ten out of ten, are the ones I can't stop thinking about. You know, like if I think about Log Horizon continually, there's always something that I'm like, oh my god, when I really think, like I can apply it to so many different situations, and like, you know, just it, it never leaves my mind. Mob Psycho is not like that for me. The first season I had mostly forgotten until we rewatched it in prep for season two. Both of them I enjoyed. I enjoyed season one even more the second time through. Season two, I'm sure those first nine episodes, if I watched them again, I would just I would feel just as strongly, um, you know, a second time watching them. That that was a great show. It has so many good emotional moments. But yeah, it's definitely not a show that like is going to linger in my consciousness the way that, uh, you know, Evangelion or Karekano or. Uh, you know, anything in my top ten. And that's completely do, that, fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's still, that is not an insult. That no. is by no means an insult to a show. We're talking about the difference between a show I give a really good score yeah. and one I give a perfect score, you know. Um, I just exactly. want to, I just want clarity because there are a lot of people who are going to consider Mob like a 10 out of 10 perfect show and I want them to understand why I'm, it's I'd be interested in a feminist me. critique on the show. Yeah? Yeah. That would I, I'd be interested. I'd be interested. Um, who would provide that? You're going to have to do it yourself. Oh, I'm not a feminist, though. <laughs> who, who is? Who even is? We'll find out. I guess I am a feminist. Next time. I don't know. On Finish or Fail. Fail. Pew, pew, pew.